May I have your attention, please? Mr. Sarkis Khouri, Director General of Antiquities, distinguished guests, dear friends. Antoine Chaya is an architect, partner, director based at the Renzo Piano Building Workshop, Paris. Born in Lebanon in 1960, he studied architecture at the Holy Spirit University of Castille, where his friendship with the, the Director General. And after graduating, joined the Paris office in 1987. He worked as a lead architect on a variety of projects, including the Kana Cultural Center in New Caledonia and the Postdamer Platz project in Berlin. Since becoming a partner in 1997, he has been the partner in charge of many other projects, including the headquarters in Milan, the Broad Contemporary Art Museum, and the Resnick Pavilion at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, California. Current projects include phase one of the new Columbia University Manhattanville campus in New York, comprised of the university's first four academic buildings. A residential project in Miami, Florida, the headquarters of the Société Générale de la Banque du Liban in Beirut, Lebanon, the Beirut City Museum, Lebanon, and the headquarters of Gaumont Pate, Paris. He has been elected Distinguished Alumni at USEC and has been recently nominated as the patron of the class of Young Architects 2017. He is an honorary member of the Lebanese Green Building Council. Finally, he has lectured in France, Italy, Denmark, Lebanon, and the USA, including talks at Columbia University Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation, as well as the AIA New York. Antoine was appointed as a member of the Renzo Piano Building Workshop Board in 2014. Please join me in welcoming Antoine. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Bader. I'm very honored to have you uh, as moderator for my talk, and I'm very honored also to have the general director of the DGA, my friend uh, Sarkis Khouri, uh, here today. Um, architecture is about designing building, but most importantly is about creating place for people to promote urban life and to exchange cultural and social uh, synergies. A good relationship with the urban context is highly important, so building can actively engage with it and uh, create harmony and the sense of inclusion, the sense of belonging to the, to the surrounding uh, neighborhood. So architecture as urbanism enhance human and urban interactive experience within the city. Among the challenges of this millennium is certainly the fragility of our Earth, which we are very lucky to have it. And of course, we, are, we have very good reason to be all very concerned about its preservation. While this common uh, responsibility is belonging to all of us, some people may have a major role to play such as architect, engineer, urbanist, but also developer, economist, scientist, uh, industrialist, but also um, politician, because architecture, urbanism, and politics, they are very well connected. So we should collectively think about our action um, 
about the sustainability of our action. And this is what we are trying to do at the Renzo Piano Building Workshop in designing building. Um, architecture for us is also designing in harmony, designing building in harmony with the environment. However, other social and civic values are also highly important for the future of our cities, for their development, and also for their sustainability, such as accessibility, permeability, lightness, openness, tolerance, mixity, accepting sharing space with other, accepting sharing space with the public realm, with the city. Mitigating the segregation between public space and private space, it's very important things. It's very important between private building and the city, as well as public building and the city. It's crucial to enhance the synergy and to create symbiosis, especially at the ground floor level where buildings are meeting the city. The ground floor, which is the natural extension of the street into the building, it's very important and is a fundamental catalyst element and unifying urban um, factor in the city. It's the real opportunity to create, to connect the building to the public realm, to the city. Architecture is also about humanizing the space, not only about designing facades. So from one side, enhancing the nature in the city, and from the other side, promoting the pedestrian realm. Uh, where the balance between the presence of the car and the presence of the pedestrian is very important, it's very fragile, delicate, and critical. And it's as we had lost this balance. This, the car had invaded our cities and had stolen it from, from, from the pedestrian. So today is the pedestrian to reconquer the city and to take it back to their realm from the car. And this is what happened everywhere around the world. What happened in New York? What happened in New York? You go today to the Times Square and you see that they reduce the traffic and they provide more space for pedestrians. They put seats and table in the street to, to dedicate, to, to, to offer more place for pedestrians. This is what happened also in, um, in London and this is what happened also in Paris. They closed the Rive Gauche and now they are closing the Rive Droite Maybe many people are not happy, but this is not bad. And why this could not happen in Beirut? In Beirut, we don't have enough space for pedestrians. So I think this is what I, I meant by humanizing the space, is giving more space in the city. It has been said, the time built city. Yes, we design buildings, and we build them, but we don't design cities. Only the time designs cities. Uh, we need to give time, See, we shape the cities, and then they shape our life for a long time, for a generation. So we should give time to the time, we should give time to the cities, because cities need time to find a soul. A city is, is, is a sort of big puzzle, a large puzzle, where every building needs to fit within its appropriate place to find roots within the city. And also to have, also to create a, uh, to generate a good living and working uh, environment. The impact of each building, of each piece of the city could be very important. So in addition to improve the urban life condition, it could be good opportunity to find urban unity, to find harmony in the city, and to create also symphony. Yes, building can create dialogue, they can speak, and even they can think. Paul Valéry, famous poet and philosopher, French philosopher, in 1935 said, have you not observed while walking in the city that among the building of which it is populated, some are dense, the other speaks, and other finally, which are more rare, think. Um, in the ancient Greek, the word polis means city. The affair of the city is politica, which means politic. So politi politics and polis, they have the same roots, the same things. 
Architecture as urbanism, urbanism as police, and police as politics. And as I previously said and mentioned, architecture, urbanism, and politics are strongly connected. Now, if a public building acting as catalyst in urban uh, realm or in the urban context seems obvious or affordable, what about private building? Can they play the same role and why not? The Pinwheel Project is um, a study that we developed with and for Solidaire in Beirut downtown where the project found its place between the old city and the new reclaimed area. It's like the new city was there and this reclaimed area coming from somewhere else came here and the project find its place as a hinge, as an articulation between the old land and the new land. The project did not start like that. We have been called to design very small building, a tower here. And then slowly, slowly, working with, uh, with Solidaire, we enlarge the, the, um, the dimension, the site, in order looking for um, urban unity. The master plan, which include only private building. I'm showing this building as an example of private because later we'll be talking about public building. The master plan, which include only private building, was designed to be completely open to the city with a very large suspended garden recalling the Babylonian garden. All these gardens were completely with, with public access connected together, all buildings connected together with bridges. The ground floor of, of the project was completely and only inhabited with function that was public access. That means the project that was completely permeable, um, transparent, luminous, and open to the city. Um, all, we did all this in order to create an urban unity because uh, um, having a coherence at the ground floor as well as the, uh, the level 24 with, the, with, the, with the, the garden gave a, a urban unity to, to this project. It was a very ambitious project. It's very large, 500,000 square meter, unfortunately has been put in hold. Um, now, there is another project um, under um, not completely under construction, we can say under excavation, is the new headquarter of the SGBL, which is also a good example of a, public, a private building open to the city. We are currently finishing the design. The project is located in the Saifi area on George Haddad Street. The ground floor of the project is completely transparent with the exception of the core because we need some elevator, we need stairs, we need shaft, so, and it was the exception of this, all the rest is completely open to the city, completely transparent, uh, fitted with um, function as, such as the bank branch, a big reception area, a foundation, art foundation, a cafe, and especially we create an urban piazza inside the project completely open to the city. So we told them this project should not be the fortress of the money. We know that this is a bank, it should not be close to the city, need to be, to be in osmosis with the city, and, and we get it. So the piazza is intended to be um, periodically used for a music concert, open for young, for jazz, for uh, classical music, and also for outdoor exhibition, taking advantage from the, from the foundation um, building to show art and some sculpture in the, uh, in the piazza. At the same time, in order to promote the art presence within the city, um, a Japanese uh, artist, uh, Susumu Shingo, is designing a mobile suspended, will be inhabiting the, the space, will be floating about the piazza and turning with, with the wind. It, with very little wind, we can turn in all directions. Um, the suspended garden, we are recalling, you know, we didn't uh, did the first project, so we are trying again, because in Beirut, um, the, the, it is the place where you use the roof. Maybe in the world, if, if there is a place where you use the roof, it's Beirut. 
And when I came here with Renzo and we walked away, he said, this is so obvious. That means in this city we have to use the roof. And we went back and we applied the concept of uh, Babylonian garden. But we are not talking about very tiny uh, trees. We are talking about trees 10, 9 to 10 meters. And I went myself to the DGU and I asked exemption in order to be allowed to have one meter of soil because today the law in Lebanon you have 40 centimeter or 50 centimeter. So with this you cannot plant trees. We went and we explained to them that this project in order to have a real suspended garden we need one meter and we get it. So this project will help to enhance the presence of the nature in the neighborhood but also will be a small lang helping the breeze of the neighborhood. It will be used also for outdoor uh, um, exhibition and, and cultural activity with limited public access, but will be from time to time also open for public. Now, how can we imagine the city of the future? I think the city of the future would be a very large public realm, unifying the whole city. Um, a public realm, transparent, luminous, um, where public building and private building are not taking possession of the ground floor. Yes, we know when you have private building, you own the, 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 the ground floor. But your ground floor needs to be open to the city. You cannot put offices here. You cannot put a cinema, movie theater on the ground floor. If you do it, you have to open to the city. So I believe the city of the future will be something where the ground floor look like um, a space above it uh, buildings are floating are flying above in levitation above this floor and also because architecture is a depiction of gravity and whitelessness of lightness of transparency and luminosity. this is not a fiction this is not a long-term uh, vision this idea is already in progress as a pioneer project in New York for Columbia University for the Manhattanville, the new campus of Columbia University in West Harlem. Yes, in West Harlem. That means not anywhere. In Harlem, a project completely open to the city. The academic problem, uh, program has been lifted up in order to free up what we call the urban layer. The urban layer is the ground floor unifying the whole campus. Here I'm showing only the phase one, which I'm uh, the partner of charge of, of, of this project, uh, and, and the ground floor is very transparent, very luminous, and no, all the space in this floor are completely open to the city. Anyone in West Harlem can get inside the space without showing ID, without asking uh, responding to any question why you are coming and again I'm talking about West Harlem not not any, anywhere not anywhere I mean um, by the way all this space as I said will be used not only by university community it will be used also by uh, West Harlem community the phase one include um, include four buildings so this first building is neuroscience the Jerome uh, L. Green Science Center is a neuroscience building. We have 800 scientists inside. We are so lucky. We have two Nobel Prize, Richard Axel and Eric Kandel, as, as uh, end user to talk with and, and to, to solve the problem. Um, the second is the School of the Art or the Lanford Center of the Art. This is the School of the Art, which house a movie theater uh, with, uh, for 150 people. It's to teach, to teach movie. And then we have a performance uh, theater to teach theater. And then we have exhibition space and uh, multi-purpose space on the top. And then the third building, that one, these two buildings have been delivered in 2017. Uh, the, the third building will be delivered this August and housing an auditorium for 430 seats. And it's not a big secret if I say that in September, uh, Hillary Clinton will be, uh, will be in this building, will have one floor in this building. So as part of the phase one, we have also what's very important, the most important element is this exterior outdoor space. It's a small piazza, completely open to the community completely open to West Harlem community. And uh, during the one of the events happened, I saw a, um, 
um, people from, from Colombia coming and playing music in the piazza here because no gate, no one asks you what are you coming. This is for the university at the same time for Colombia. And this is what does mean sharing space with the city. And this is what does mean tolerance. Being tolerant is accepting others. The fourth building, we just finished the, um, uh, the pre-schematic design for, for this building is Again, here all this is above one billion dollar project. So, um, in this building, we have the global center. The global center is to treat and to think about the problem of humanity, and also including the Earth Institute. And now, currently, we are working on on two buildings here: the fifth and the sixth building on feasibility study. Um, this is an image showing uh, buildings under, under, under completion. This is the uh, Jerome Green Center, the School of the R, the Forum, and this is the small piazza with the trees uh, just planted. The Central Energy Plan. So I neglect to say that in the same phase we have the CEP, the Central Energy Plan, which feed um, uh, energy for, for the phase one and the phase two, and the two chimney on the top are coming, they are the stacks of this CEP. Um, this is an image of the, uh, of the small square um, showing how it's completely open to the city. The piazza, uh, this is a view from the piazza looking to the Jerome Green Center and I'm, I'm showing here the interior street because inside this building we have an interior street connecting this, the piazza with Broadway. Again, public access. You can, if you are in Broadway, you open the door and you get into the building and you have an information center as a periscope showing what happened upstairs. No one will ask you ID. And you can cross and come to the, to the piazza. So this is the corner of the MBB inhabited with a restaurant cafe completely open to the, to the piazza. This is partially view, again, for the, uh, for the building, for the Jerome Green and for the uh, Lemphis Center. This is showing the interior passage or the interior street from Broadway to the piazza inside the information center where on the wall we have a screen, a active screen showing what happened upstairs and uh, providing scientific information about the brain. Because the building, uh, the other name of the building is the mind-brain behavior. This building is really specialized on brain activity. The lab scene from Broadway behind the, behind the, the elevated uh, subway, which causes a lot of problem, and I will show later a relationship between the building and the urban con contain. So this, this, this viaduct is part of DNA of, of, the, of the area, because in Europe, when you come, uh, in order to find roots with the site, you have the urban fa fabric. It's more or less easy. Um, here, everything has been cleaned. So we were just looking to something to, to find roots. The only things we found was the two grandfather. Renzo called this the grandfather because this is the DNA, the industrial DNA of the building. And we tried to learn from this and to develop the building structure to create dialogue between the building and the structure. So we expose, we have some exposed um, structured steel outside in order to create dialogue with the building. Other things that the building has to deal with the urban uh, context constraint, including noises and vibration. We have 88 decibel here on, on the subway, and we have to cut 50% to inside. So how solve the problem? Because we have scientists need to work inside. So we, we had a double skin, which acting as um, environmental element, but at the same time, uh, providing the acoustic mitigation and cutting from 88 decibel to 44 decibel. The steel structure, as I said, has been exposed to outside in order to create dialogue with the, uh, with the viaduct. And this is more recent uh, uh, photo of, of the exterior space of the piazza and the MBB and the Lamfest. This is a photo of the uh, Jerome Green Center before the construction of the forum, because the forum will come here. And this photo during, currently during the construction of the forum, which is the third building, and the fourth building will come, will come here. Now, this is about, I gave free example of good private uh, project that uh, were concerned and tried to be connected with the city. 
Now, what about public building? I think the Beirut History Museum is a local example in Beirut of how public building can act as catalyst of public realm. Conceived as a place of exchange where history, culture, art, science, communication, and society will intertwine. It will be a space dedicated to memory, light, and life. The project, we are very lucky. It's really, we haven't to do anything. We are so lucky that the, 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 the project site is, um, is limited by the Martyr Square, is, is, is located between the Martyr Square to the south and the Tell site, the archaeological part of the Tell site to the north. So the, the Martyr Square represents the recent past of Beirut. You know that. The, the Tell site represents the ancient past of, of Beirut. And the, the museum is as a threshold, as a link between the ancient past and the recent past located in between. As you know, the Martyr Square, this is a sketch made by Renzo. Uh, this is the way we work. So he did sketch, he sent to me, but it's iPhone, and then we can work. So in this sketch, uh, he is showing um, that the Martyr Square, which was a demarcation line during the war, separating East from West, is still maintaining today in, the, in our collective memory a sort of national consciousness. Uh, today, the project sees, seeks to re-establish uh, the role of the Martyr Square um, in creating an urban, human, and cultural synergies, including the Beirut City Museum. That means we are taking advantage from the fact that we are designing the museum. Well, we are not alone, we are a very large team, including the DGA, including the Minister of Culture, including uh, Solidaire, including ATB. It's a very large group, we are working all together. And the idea is really to consider, to, to reestablish the, the historical lore of the, of the Martyr Square, but including also the museum and the TEL as one vision and one project, all this area one project, including also the landscape, because landscape is very important. So our goal is to create, um, to create a unifying place and a destination in Beirut. And of course, as I said, the landscape is very important, including the trees, including flooring, um, furniture, lighting, uh, and all this in order to create an urban unity in Beirut. And this is what I said in the beginning, every project could be the opportunity to find unity. Because if you have this land to work with, you close your eyes saying, this is not my problem. My land is here. You are wrong. Every project for us, I'm talking about our experience, is good opportunity to talk with, with the city, with everyone, to understand how we can improve the urban context. Because we are concerned. We, can live, we cannot live alone. And as I said, the building the relationship between the building and the city is at the ground floor. It's always a good opportunity to connect together. The Martyr Square would be an urban place for people with a reduced traffic around. And this is what we are trying to do today, working with everyone, with the CDR, with everyone can help. Yesterday and today we had also a meeting with the governor, we had a meeting with the mayor in order to understand how they can help us to bring this again to the pedestrian rim, to reduce the presence of the car in the city, and especially to reduce the number of lanes here. So we are negotiating today. Instead of four, can we have two? So we can deviate cars. We would like to bring this back to the public rim, because the relationship between, as you will see, between the Martyr Square and the museum is very important. So like that, the Martyr Square could be also the opportunity to have um, art exhibition or other temporary um, social outdoor activities to humanize the urban context, creating active urban life, but not ceremonial or monumental. Today, this area is used only for monumental event or ceremonial, but I think, we think, that could be for more simple use. It could be 
um, used for a jazz concert, could be used for open door uh, cinema once a week, could be used also for a market, flower market, or maybe why not uh, uh, vegetable market once a week. That means need to be need to be used in normal way by the people of the city, but not in only in ceremonial and monumental way. Um, the museum site looks like a continuous excavation from the tell site until the Petisserai. We are pretending that we came and we have this um, continuous arche archaeological excavation and the museum is coming from somewhere else and inhabiting the, the heart of this, uh, of this area. Uh, in order to provide a program for the project, like including exhibition space and direct, with direct access to the, um, um, to the archaeological site. Uh, semantically speaking, giving the location of the site towards the sea, the sea is here, but also um, looking at the relationship between Beirut and also Lebanon, also Beirut, with the sea, with the navigation. The project seeks some, um, uh, some uh, references or some um, uh, navigation and nautical inspiration. So the idea is to consider the project like lighthouse. Okay, this is the relationship with the nautical uh, inspiration. It's lighthouse, it's like a cube inhabiting the space under the street. So mainly the product is made with two pieces. One piece, which is the glass cube coming from the history, from, in, from the relationship between Beirut and the sea. And the second part, which under the street, is more connected to the archaeology and is talking the archaeology language. So the idea is, because this building without archaeology, inside and outside does not make sense, could be office building. The idea is to consider that, that this piece is part from outside, even from the, the way it's done. So this is very heavy and hard piece connected to the archaeology, and the very light and delicate piece is connected to the history. Um, creating a, a pedestrian friendly area it's a very important topic. Why? Because we would like to use the people coming from the Martyr Square to the Museum Esplanade so okay, they can cross the street without any danger because today you have to be a kamikaze to cross here. And we create a small piazza open to the city in front of the museum. We will not have a fence here. This will be a meeting place open to the city which gives you the possibility from here to enter to the museum and from here also to be connected with the age, with the Bronze Age glacier and the Hellenistic Tower, at the same time give you the opportunity to go around the museum and having a viewing, viewing terrace with a panoramic view to the archaeological part. The piazza will provide, as I said, all this function, but also will provide access to the, to the ground floor level. Um, from the master plan, the master plan gave us some, uh, some rules. The master plan said to us you have to keep the uh, transparency between the martyr square and the sea. It's saying you cannot exceed the 15 meter high and we cannot, this volume cannot exceed the third of the, of the lot. The lot is 1500 square meter. So the, this area exceeding the ground floor cannot exceed 500 square meter and this is what we did. So transparency and permeability is a crucial, uh, is a crucial element. Um, the, the museum will be, will be made with, 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 six level, with six level, two are dedicated for exhibition. All the part, of course I'm saying under the street, but if you see here all this part under the street is uh, visually and some are physically connected with the archaeology. So you get to the museum, you do what you want to do, you see what you have to see, and then you go to the restaurant, you have the terrace outside, and from here you continue your journey through the archaeology outside. And the same in this exhibition area. Today you are still, uh, we need to understand what exactly happened. This is really indicative. But the idea is to, to, under, to, to have a, a strong relationship between archaeology, between outside and inside. The museum is designed as a time machine. The glass cube will be inhabited with 
with the, the, the floor that we need, but also other um, uh, elevators, um, uh, freight lift elevator, and the shaft, and everything we need, suspended light, everything we need to make it to make this space work correctly. The north facade, as I said, is completely, because we don't have some penetration on the north, we have the good light, all this area is completely open to the, to the archaeological park. The ground, this is the, the lowest basement, is, is really dedicated for exhibition uh, with no daylight, because this level is dedicated for very sensitive objects they don't like they don't like or they don't need um, daylight. This is the level just above, again, for the, uh, for the artifact uh, um, collection with visual and physical uh, connection to the outdoor archaeology. This is the, uh, uh, the floor of the, the restaurant floor, the restaurant cafe with the bookstore. And what we have here, we have an educational center with outreach program open to school and families and everyone curious and need to understand and to learn about archaeology. Uh, of course, in addition to this, we have a small space uh, dedicated for talk, for a uh, screening room. You can, have, you can receive a class from one school. The museum can host uh, uh, the school for, uh, for one course and they can, have, uh, they can have projections. So this facade is um, it's completely transparent, then you can have the shade going down, you have the uh, projection, and then at the end everything will raise and you will see outdoor the archaeology. Uh, this is the BG1, the below grade number one, with uh, some exhibition space, uh, administrative, and here we have restroom and support space. The ground floor, as I said, is the direct and the... Um, no, sorry, this is the, the first floor. The first floor is above the ground floor, is a floor dedicated for, it's like a viewing platform open to the archaeology and so you can connect to the, to the tell, have information, you can have some pieces or some information related to what happened here, is connected also to the Bronze Age gla um, glacier and uh, Hellenistic tower as well as uh, view, uh, visual connection with the Martyr Square. The roof is about 750 square meter, is fitted with PV cell in order to produce energy um, for the museum. It's completely solid in the middle and becomes more transparent uh, at the edges, at the, um, the cantilevers. This is a view from the model from the top. This is another uh, exploded axonometric showing all this floor that I, I, I just described to the, to the cube. This is again a study model showing exactly all these level together with the, with the shape of the museum, with the model of the museum. Now I would like to say something about sustainability. So the project will be very responsible. The project is um, the, the sustainability will be part of the, of the design without being fashionably explicit. We will not show that we are very good showing, putting um, things, um, decorative things to show that you are sustainable. Sustainability is very discreet on this project. So the project, mainly, the, the maybe three quarters of the project is built under the street. So the thermal inertia of the project, it's very good because a very small, small piece, a glass piece, is above. But all this area around is really with opaque, uh, with opaque envelope. Um, we have the roof, we are producing, the roof is acting as urban umbrella. It's protecting from the sun, especially in, in, the, in the summer. So this is the sun angle at midday, because this is the south facade. And if we report here, we see that there is no sun penetration in the sun on the south facade. On the east and west facade, because as you know, the sun is low. The sun in the, in the winter is quite low. Go from east, south, and west. In the summer, in the hot season, the sun is higher. The sun making like that from east to south. So on east and west, in the, in the winter, the sun is lower. We are protecting the outer facade with, with a shade, motorized shade. When the facade is hit by the sun, the shade will go automatically down. When the, the sun is turning and no sun on the facade, the sensor will detect it and the shade will, will raise. Um, I would like to mention that we are still exploring geothermal solution for this project. Yesterday we had a very uh, long meeting with specialists 
and we are trying to understand where we can find water and if possible to use the water in order to provide HVAC uh, for the building. Uh, we are still exploring this and we hope that this, this will work one day. Um, natural ventilation also will be explored in mid-season. You know, we, during maybe six months in the, in the year, we can have fresh air coming from here and you don't use HVAC because day like today, for example, of course, here a little bit hot now because, but anyway, uh, it, it, natural ventilation can, can work and we can save energy. And also the use of the daylight, we, can, we are maximizing the, the use of the daylight combined with the, so daylight and artificial light uh, achieving light harvesting for the building. Uh, this is study model for the roof. I said the roof, we, we had some inspiration from nautical, so this is the way that big ship are are built and we are trying to, to use a structure that allow us to cross with, with the, the duct. This is the, um, the roof, the edge of the roof fitted with, with PV cell and how it becomes degressive when you go to the, to the edge. So we don't add with something completely solid. This is also another view showing the, um, the roof from below. The building breathes through the roof. The roof is, is like uh, uh, breathing from, from, from this area. So above the facade here, in order to achieve the natural ventilation between in this area, so we have a space where the building can breathe. And because we have noise outside, we are studying here a, a sound trap which allow you to breathe, to take, to have, to provide um, exit for the natural ventilation, at the same time stop the uh, noise coming from outside. Again and again models showing because the facade is really uh, suspended, a structure suspended from, from, from the roof. So we have the roof is big diaphragm, uh, structure diaphragm from which we are putting cable and we are suspending the facade from the top and everything will be, will be connected. These are the, uh, the shade, the automated shade uh, are part of this facade. Again, uh, other drawing showing the, the, the steel system. This drawing is just to show you at two different scale. This is the east elevation showing the 15 me meter uh, limited by the master plan and the urban presence. So it's not an arrogant uh, presence. It's very subtle presence in the urban context. And this is, is the, um, the west elevation from uh, on the hard side. Um, the project seeks transparency, lightness, and luminosity in order to achieve a subtle relationship between archaeology, nature, and technology with respect to the environment. And thank you. Thank you. I will help you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Antoine, for a most interesting presentation. Thank you. And, of course, a uh, very important part of it, which is uh, the one that, uh, that's dealing with Beirut, of course, and Beirut Museum. Uh, just a parenthesis to introduce myself for those of you who don't know me. Um, uh, Leila Badr, the director of the Archaeological Museum and the excavator of the ancient tell, uh, part of the ancient tell of Beirut. Um, I think now we open the space for discussion and discussion. And I welcome, and I think Atwan would welcome, uh, all sorts of questions. questions. Please, please give your Thank name. You. I'm the director of the Neighborhood Initiative at the UB now. Um, thank you for the very interesting presentation. I have three very quick comments. One, when you spoke about uh, giving back uh, uh, from the vehicular to the pedestrian in cities, and you talked uh, about the Rive uh, Droite and Rive Gauche in Paris. We have this with little experience in Jean d'Arc recently. The Neighborhood Initiative with the Center for Civic Engagement redesigned the Jean d'Arc Street. We deleted one uh, parking lane, parking lane. On the, on the right side, and we had six years of negotiations with the shop owners because they thought that deleting 33 parkings, parking spaces is really catastrophic. 
and uh, but but the, uh, what we convinced them is that we're giving you back a 3.5 meter sidewalk with a safe passage with benches with urban furniture and only this year it was executed and until today many people are still skeptical whether this was a good thing to do or not so i hope this will be one for for the city to to follow the second thing is um about uh, when you said about the the uh, idealistic actually project of the babylonian gardens uh, hanging gardens which you showed the 500,000 square meter I just wanted to point out that the yachting club or uh, in Zaytuna Bay had the intention to connect the corniche to its roof one building small building and if you go now today you see the columns there just to support the bridge but they didn't go ahead because nobody wants public access on the roof of, of the of one public building so it will be it's one dream to go to go forward and the last thing is, uh, it's a very personal thing. I was waiting when you were ex uh, ex uh, talk talking about the museum. Um, because to me, as an architect, uh, and I, I was very publicly against the Solidaire project, uh, for, for, uh, for me and the people who supported that side of view was that Martyr Square has lost its identity by being open to the sea because it was a square. It had a back backdrop. It has the Rivoli Cinema, and that w that is in the in the collective memory of everybody. So now your project is actually where the Rivoli Cinema was. You're taking that, um, you know, that thing that was taken out totally, and in favor, of course, of the master plan transparency and and height. So I was waiting. Where would the Rivoli Cinema memory or the morphology of that that piazza reappear? And I don't know why I thought when you said uh, open air cinema that sometimes this museum's facade would actually be the actual screen just to give some, you know, life back to that collective memory. I just wanted to reflect on Good. that. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I will start with the first question about the last year. You know, um, usually when you go to the doctor, when you have a problem and you go to the doctor, you don't tell him what you love to have he need to give you the right treatment. So if you are expecting him to give you the right, what you would like to have, then you don't go to the doctor. And this is what happened on, on different level in the city. If you go and you ask citizen, do you agree to, to, do, to increase the presence of the nature and deleting some parking, of course they will say no. I had, we had this, this morning, we had a small meeting and the mayor uh, uh, office and we were talking about similar discussion. Yesterday we had another meeting uh, with the governor and we had similar discussion about that and everyone is saying that people they don't care. Everyone had three four cars. He more care about place in the car for his car in the city and doesn't care about trees in the city. So I think this is a civic problem. Okay? We have, we the Lebanese, we have a lot of quality. But sometimes we need also to accept to change and to adapt ourselves to the, to how can we respond to the, to the uh, fragility of our earth if we don't accept to reduce the presence of the car in the city. So in London today, in order to get in the city, you pay a tax. In Paris, yes, they close the Rive Gauche and Rive Droite. Many people are complaining a lot, but I'm supporting this action. I really in favor. When I walk with my family, we go and we walk, and it's so beautiful. I don't use my car in Paris. I don't need it. Sometimes I forget where it is. I don't know. I have now an application on my iPhone to find my car because I don't use it. I use it maybe once a month. So I think, but this is a very complicated problem in Beirut because it's connected to the public transportation. And this is not an easy problem, but you know, you need to start somewhere. You need to start somewhere. If not, you cannot uh, use the pretext that uh, I can do this, I can do this, so I don't do anything. No, you have to start somewhere. Um, with regard to Zaytuni Bay, I, I'm not the expert, I don't know what happened, but I heard by pure chance, by pure chance, nothing to do with this, I heard a story from someone is uh, I think he has the information that uh, the project uh, has been stopped because they were not allowed to to cover it for other reason. The question is not they want to go there or not to go there. It's something completely 
nothing to do with the architect and with the, uh, with the developer. I'm, I'm sure about this question. Uh, for, for the museum, um, yes, it's a very delicate topic. Um, I would like just to invite you and to drop your attention to the fact that cities cannot live in the past. Cities need to evolve. Uh, we have to, to, to have to believe in the city mutation. Uh, in the past, when Hausmann imposed his master plan in Paris, which today becomes big reference, go to Paris and to see the Hausmann. Do you know what happened? In my talk, I said something about architecture, urbanism, and politics. They are deeply, strongly connected. Hausmann was for Napoleon III, he was the governor, senator, and minister. And Napoleon III opened uh, uh, the drawer and said to him, take the money that you need. I am provided the protection. I give you everything, but do your plan. And what he did, he, he didn't care about uh, building, a, I'm sure they, they demolish maybe some valued building, but you know, um, uh, there is a, a Japanese uh, say said, uh, you should not, Hiroko will be happy because he, she uh, teach me this. Um, yeah, that uh, when you look, don't look the leaf. You have to, to see first the forest. You need to see the forest and then you go to see the leaf. Because if you, if you are lost looking to the leaf, then you don't see the vision. And this is what, we ha what is happening with a lot of people about many things. Uh, so, um, yes, w when, when you are architect and someone asks you to build here, so what you do? You say, I, I don't build. So in Beirut, there is a master plan. Master plan approved by the President of the Republic with a decree, presidential decree has been approved by all authorities. They call you and they say, this site has been dedicated by the Minister of Culture to do this museum. What you say? We don't do it? I mean, no. So I'm, I'm saying, no, I'm just trying to, uh, to highlight the, the question of Rivoli being here or not here. And then Beirut, it's, uh, you know, I, I'm not an academician. I'm, unfortunately, I'm only uh, someone who practice architecture. I have the chance to work on the uh, Potsdam Plus project where we came. When we came on the Potsdam Plus, we, um, uh, we find no man's land. It was completely empty. Uh, so many things were demolished and uh, many other things were left and they decide to to clean everything, to have Lourdes. So... Uh, first, you don't have to excuse yourself because you are a practitioner. Okay, so please don't. We are honored here to, to be with a practitioner. It's part of the theme of this conference. However, I would like to uh, respond to Mona's remark concerning the Rivoli building. I think that Mona is addressing a recent past, but within this recent past, there's also the French planning that initially, this was actually, the initial plan was to open the Place des Martyrs to the sea. And we still have the plans now. Actually, the Rivoli building went against this plan. So the plan, Rivoli, is a building that should not have been there in the first place. Something, you know, another point, Mona, is that, you know, when the Rivoli building was there, we did not have the tell excavations yet. So we did not have an archaeological park. So all what I'm saying is that sometimes we don't need to be fixed on details. We need to put history in its recent and real perspective. OK, uh, this, is, uh, this is the argument that I want to say. Because, because most of the time, uh, OK, we see this, the city from a very short perspective and this is your generation I understand that okay you always saw uh, cinema Rivoli as at the end you know with all the cultural 
background and we need that it has. But we need to have a more comprehensive view of our recent history. And, and I think that the museum, as, as uh, the city center stands now and, and the axis of the Marti Square, you know, as a connection between Marti Square and the tell, the, uh, you know, where, where the city was born actually, is a project that has to be done. It cannot be discussed, you know. It has to be done. Yeah, that's all. It's not about nostalgia. Yeah. Rivoli is nostalgia. No. But I think we have other references too. Okay, we have the ten too. Okay. Um. Here. Yes. I'm here. Here. Ah, sorry. Sorry. First of all, I want to uh, really uh, 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 I'm very happy that you're using in the landscape for the Societe Generale building the uh, uh, Lebanese pine tree when you refer to the yeah. park as opposed to the palm tree or all of that that you are actually bringing back to Beirut the uh, native uh, trees. This is very really nice that to bring it. My other question is uh, for that uh, project also. Um, you mentioned that it's you're trying to like there's a public space, but you men you mentioned that that might be not always available for the public. Is there like in other cities like in New York, there's always these uh, part of the development they require them to maybe give a, a public a public park or the plazas in Manhattan. They're they're, they're private, but they're used by the public. Is there a way that this could start happening in, in, with, with these projects, since you're talking about the ground floor being yeah. open mm -hmm. to the public? Yeah. And the other question is, the crossing between uh, the Petit Sarai to the museum. You mentioned that it, it should be easy. Uh, will, will there still be cars there, as that has been discussed? That will there, because that's very important to connect between Martyr Square and, and the museum. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Great, thank you for this question. So with regard to the garden, yes, uh, I appreciate your note. I, uh, um, effectively, we, you know, we have, we, I said we have to be responsible. In Beirut, we have a water problem, correct? We are designing garden. Um, when I present the project in the DGU, uh, uh, Mr. Berge Hadjian asked me, okay, you are offering Beirut a uh, beautiful, uh, uh, helping Beirut to breathe, so how you will be irrigating this? Uh, because, you know, you can't always all explain. So, in our sustainable approach, we are recovering the condensation water of the, HVH, the HVAC unit. So, the park is about 4,000 square meter. We need four cubic meter per day for the irrigation because we are not irrigating like that. It's with tube and uh, little water. Uh, the water coming from the HVAC condensation is 35 cubic meter per day. We are using only four to five cubic meter and the rest has been used for the toilet. So in the tree selection, we went to native trees. Now we are struggling with the pine. We are struggling because some local consulting is saying you have to be careful with the roots that they will attack the, the waterproofing membrane. This is not the, uh, the opinion, the technical opinion of our French consultant who built all um, uh, Disneyland and helped us to plant trees 24 meters in New Caledonia. Uh, he's saying, I will try, and the local consultant is saying, don't try with the pine. So we are not giving up on native trees we may not be able to use the pine, but we'll be using other native trees like the, um, the, uh, the elex, the uh, Quercus elex, or maybe uh, the ficus or, or things like that. But we will be using native trees. Um, with regard to your question about public space, yes. We had the chance to have an intelligent client. You know, we don't take all the project came to us. We refuse many projects. So the client usually selects the architect. In our case, we select the client with who we can work. And we have a very good client who is listening to us. We said to him, if you are, if you are aiming to design, 
the fortress of the money, we are not the right people, you don't need us. If you accept to design, if you accept to have a permeable building, okay, we are very good for that. So we are designing together the program at the ground floor, and we are still talking, we, are, we start to talk about program for this exterior space, including activity for young, jazz, but also other music, also cultural uh, event, including art exhibition, because the bank has a art collection. One of the three buildings is art foundation. So we will have art exhibition inside. Okay. At the same time, we have also some archaeological pieces that will be left on site and will be integrated inside the building. So we, are, we have very good reason to have public access to this building. And we don't have any private space at the ground floor. Once you don't have a private space, this is only public access function, then of course people will get in. Uh, the last question with regard to the Petit Sarai connection with the Martyr Square, effectively, this is good point. And we, uh, uh, one day I had a presentation to the, uh, to the Prime Minister Salam and the Prime Minister Sanura was there. And he asked me the question, saying, okay, you are talking about crossing, so what, how you do? And I said, um, uh, with the CDR and Solidar, we ask a, a, a study, traffic study, in that area, in order to deviate the car today, everyone would go to, even to, to Beirut, anywhere, it will be passing this because it's, it's nice. You pass, you create circulation, you create problem, and a lot of cars. But if you say people going directly to, I don't know, to, to the airport or to somewhere else, don't pass here, you deviate from on the, on the sea level, then you reduce the number of the car. And we are saying that even the, the flooring treatment of this area need to be done for pedestrian. So the pedestrian will be welcome. The car is not welcome, but is tolerated, of course, for delivery, for uh, ambulances, uh, police, all of this, they will have access, but also private people they have. But uh, they will be somehow penalized in putting a traffic uh, light in order to reduce the, the car uh, speed in the city and promote a pedestrian friendly area. And with the CDR today, yesterday, uh, Nabil Aitani is here. We had discussion with him, and we are asking help to sit down and to see in which way we can narrow this. Um, I mean, we are having help from everyone, CDR, the, the, the mayor, the, the governor, uh, uh, with Solidaire, of course, and uh, working with the DGA. Everyone is really helping us in order to make this pedestrian-friendly area possible in that area. Um, my name is Mario. I'm currently developing my thesis on construction as a destructive tool for cultural heritage. I've chosen your particular site in Saifi um, for SGBL. Um, <clears throat> however, my question is directed to you and to Professor Bedir um, in general towards archaeology in the city. Um, funnily enough, the Museum of Archaeology is in current excavation and however you've sort of created uh, a glass box pre-designed placed on top of the current excavation without really knowing what's there. I personally think that the tile never really needed a museum. It was an open air museum by itself. So where does the role of the architect or the archaeologist or their responsibility both together uh, towards unexpected finds uh, start interlocking? What's the agenda of the DGA and what's the agenda of architects? when we know um, that before looking at the leaf, we look at the forest, as you mentioned, and downtown by itself is a forest of archaeology. Shouldn't there be sort of law that is changed in order to excavate and then design? Yeah, that's it. You would like me to start? Yeah, then I will answer you. So, um, cities need vision. Unfortunately, cities, I mean, um, why, why sometimes you need people to take responsibility and to design cities and to make decisions? And making decisions, it's not always easy. So from time to time, someone needs to make decisions about making something happen. One day in New York, New York, it's, 
it's very expensive fight. One day, one decide that this area will be dedicated for nature, and he create the Central Park. Someone else in, in Hyde Park in London, someone decide that this need to be dedicated for that, and he said, you cannot build here. In Beirut, this decision has been made a long time ago by the Ministry of Culture. They decided that this site need to be dedicated to this activity. And this site has been excavated several times, and I think you, maybe you are more qualified than me to explain how many times, and yourself, and you find things you find, and you thought are valuable, and I saw them in the, in the National Museum. So the site was excavated. Many valuable um, archaeologists work on the site and, and excavate and found things. Today, if we would like to keep every stone we see in this city, you don't do anything. We have just, to be honest, we have to leave Beirut as big archaeological site and go live somewhere else. We need to be very honest. Everywhere in Beirut, under every street, every tree, you have archaeology. We should not be hypocrite. I cannot be hypocrite. We have to watch and to accept that cities need to, need to uh, accept mutation and accept evolution. Now, having something here, um, yes, someone can say this is natural. I mean, uh, we can be lazy and saying it's easy. So we don't, we don't affront the problem. We say that this is open air museum. It's not correct because the museum has a lot, a lot of very beautiful piece uh, telling the story of Beirut. And by the way, this, this museum is not an archaeological museum. This museum has a mission to tell Beirut story. And Beirut story is not only one period or two periods or three periods. Many periods of Beirut, of Beirut story, are not on the site. So what you do with this? You know, Beirut, Lebanon is what it is. Okay, you have religion, you have community, you have politics. It's a very complex context. You cannot make decision excluding others. Part of Beirut history does not exist on this site. How you tell it? Okay? So I think I, I, I'm hearing you. I'm sensitive to what you are saying. But in the meantime, I know that um, responsible, I mean, um, uh, uh, Dr. Khoury is uh, is very responsible uh, the person. The, the Minister of Culture is very, very responsible. They have a huge responsibility. They are thinking about this every day. And I think this is really in their hand and they will be making decision. This is what I have to say. As far as I'm concerned, uh, yes, it's very important to preserve the site, but it's not that easy. It's easy to say and more difficult to do. Um, I give an example. Uh, our archaeological excavations under the St. George Cathedral of the Greek Orthodox, there it was easy. There was no problem, no mm, uh, urban problem, let's say, and we preserved it into a small, very uh, didactic educational museum and very clear uh, to be visited. Now, when we excavated the archaeological site the, of the ancient Tel, of course it was easier to preserve and it was my main uh, concern to ask for its preservation we were excavating and uh, because it was a government space, it is not a private space, so it's much easier to deal with it. And uh, we had the UNESCO uh, team to handle this. At that time, it was more organized, let's say, because it was a smaller uh, project in terms of how many excavations we, we were doing. So the site was classified and uh, the idea of uh, preserving it into a museum 
has been there for a very long time and I think it's a very good initiative that uh, this project of the museum is going on. And yes, you call it historical, the history museum. Uh, I see little history in that museum. It's more archaeological museum, uh, I think. And my concern is the space you give for the exhibition. Um, I, I looked at the several layers. You have two layers, uh, architectural layers, uh, for exhibition. And there are about three or four for administration, for cafeteria, for uh, other uh, um, uh, events. And at that time, I made this remark and I suggested that, first of all, cafeteria, you are surrounded by restaurants. Do we really need a cafeteria? Maybe for income, and I don't think how much income does it give uh, to the space. Um, uh, yes, Sursok Museum may tell you if they are uh, very rich, uh, but they have not a cafeteria inside the museum. It is, it is always open and, and in the evening, but that's another uh, subject. And admin so you don't need really a cafeteria and administration. You can also have it outside the space. This space is so valuable and it has to contain more of the archaeology of uh, Beirut and even history. And you have so many excavations. I don't know how you can fit them there. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for this comment. So we will invite you next time. Sorry. Can can I? I would like just to 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 say some comment and then uh, thank you for your comment. Next time we'll invite you for the workshop to talk about the program. No, I would like to reassure you that uh, maybe I I misexplain. So we don't have six equal levels. Under the street, the level is um, 1,500 square meter. We have two levels, but including also mechanical. So we will have net something like about 2,000 square meter and below grade, plus something maybe 2,500 from 5,000 dedicated for exhibition. But the building, uh, as a car, in order to run it, you need a motor. You need you need some mechanical. You need you need uh, some support space. You need toilet. Now, uh, with regard to your comment. Even the restaurant will not be a, a stupid restaurant in the sense that I think in that area will be also the opportunity to, to show some archaeological piece. And here we need to work with uh, uh, Dr. Khoury. So I'm still saying that, uh, that we, in this museum we, we need to have some big pieces. So we need to sit down one day and with your help to identify some large piece that could be seen not necessarily inside the exhibition space and could be also dispersed everywhere even at the ground floor level when you arrive you can put pieces okay it's you I mean we, we, this, the the archaeology will be dispersed everywhere in the museum we don't have a space without archaeology so I'm hearing you, but don't worry, we have enough space for exhibition. But having said this, where you are right, the museum is small, yes. Because the lot is 1,500 square meters. And we have been asked to do 5,000. And we, can, we are already two meters below the sea level. So it's, it's not easy. At the same time, for this reason, what we are saying, we cannot, I mean, this area is, could not be reduced. Cannot be. It's. Um, I agree with you. Not maybe enough, but this is the maximum we can get. Thank you. Thank you for the presentations. Uh, I think providing public spaces does not mean public participation. Uh, if you look at downtown today, it's empty, and the reason for this emptiness is that maybe it has nothing to do with most of the Lebanese population. Not in terms of affordability not in terms of culture. And the projects that you have proposed, they're similar in nature. So I think that we need this issue of public participation needs to be addressed differently. Yeah. So. Yeah. OK, I understand. Um, I, sorry. Yes.
I'll just answer this very quickly and give you the floor. Uh, the public participation, if, uh, if you have participated in the uh, nocturne of the museums, uh, which was organized by the Ministry of Culture, you would realize that there were about 6,000 visitors in the major museums. So people are attracted, but they have to be invited. And the space has to be inviting. So when you invite the people, they would come. But our people are not educated to visit museums. And besides, remember the proverb, the Arabic proverb, the Lebanese people, when they go abroad, the first thing they do, they go to a museum. But here, it's taken for granted. They don't really make the effort to, to do so. I, I will respond then. I will take. I will respond. But I would like maybe is there is a lady there. She would like to ask questions. But I will respond. I take note. Okay. Hi. Um, my question is that both of the projects are a bank and a museum, which are high security projects, and which you uh, have decided to liberate the ground floor and open it to the public. So, do you know any measures that will be taken in the future after the execution of the project uh, to secure the, the 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 building? and like cameras, security men, uh, etc. And do you think that those measures might compromise the public aspect of the, of the, uh, of the ground floor um, and thus make it uninviting for the public? Okay, very clear for me. Okay, so um, I will start by responding to, to your question about the public space. And uh, I understand, I appreciate your question. So, yes. Uh, I agree in the sense that the quality of the public access space needs to be uh, uh, better defined. But um, last year, I had a colleague in Kaslik, uh, jointly with Amira Salah, which is here, about Beirut. And um, I had a talk, and they asked me to conclude the symposium on Beirut. And I finished by saying, I mean, during my talk, I talk about architecture, urbanism, and politics. Please don't, don't forget it. Uh, when I closed the symposium, I said, if you give me the magic wand, I do two things in Beirut. First of all, I will be moving the parliament from this pedestrian area. Put it somewhere else in safe area, because uh, I'm very concerned about the deputy safety, of course. But they can go somewhere else where it's more safer for them and leave this space for the poor pedestrian to enjoy and take advantage from the city center. The second element, I will move the, the Marines from Beirut. Even in, in Zimbabwe, you don't have a military site in the city center. Never. So if you take away these two um, high security functions from the city center, you can hop having more people walking, you will see more military closing street and imposing security limit in the city. Um, so this is also to do with politics because, because it's, it's very clear. I, mean, I left Lebanon 30 years ago. You know better than me politics here. But I think uh, there is a political issue. Um, now, um, to respond to your question with security, yes, a traditional um, conventional solution for security are made. Um, but we had this discussion talking with them. I would like to give another example. After the 9-11 in New York, we were completing the New York Times Tower in uh, Times Square. And at that time, when the two towers um, went down, um, we said what to do. Uh, we said to the client what to do about terrorism, about uh, things like that. If someone came and put a bomb in the seat, he said, I refuse to build a bunker for the future. I refuse to fall in their trap. They are guiding us to be, uh, to live in, 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 
uh, in, in I don't know how to say it in English. In, in, yes, in, in, in catastrophic way. So we, we, we refuse to do it. And he said, Renzo, go ahead with a glass building, this built to the future, not to the past. And when we are designing today Columbia University, the new campus, the Manhattanville, Lee Bollinger, the president, said, we are in, in the middle of West Harlem. Okay, we are not in, we are in Harlem. Okay, you know what that means, Harlem. <laughs> so, with no fence, this is what is making the difference between the old um, campus, the uh, Morningside campus, and the Manhattanville campus. One is gated, completely enclosed, and the second one is urban, completely open to the city. And you know, yes, you, you have, we have to be open to the, to the future. We have to, and this is part of our resistance. That means if there are many ways to resist, but if you fall in the, um, in the paranoia, and then, then you, you can't sleep. But we are doing everything we can do to mitigate risk, accepting the civic role in the city is to share the space and to this is about tolerance because the value of the century tolerance is part of the value and tolerance mean accepting other that means sharing the space with other and sharing the space also with the city Yeah, it may happen. It, it may happen. I hope, I hope, you know, it, it may happen. Yeah, I, 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 we cannot predict. But uh, at least the design is based on this, uh, is, is based on, on this assumption. And the client is willing to, to play the game. So I think we had, we had good intention, then, then we'll see what happened. But if we, if we as said, if we built our cities, um, then, then we, uh, we shape our cities in that way, then the city will shape us for generations, for a long time. So we cannot live around surrounded by bunkers. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, I have a question. Uh, uh, I'll be quick because it's about the same subject. Just a quick remark about the Beirut City Museum. My understanding that it's 50% archaeology, 50% orientation to the rest of the city, both geographically and historically. So it's not a, uh, the way I understand it is that it's not a container of artifacts exclusively, but also a place, it's a, it's a platform to embark on understanding. The whole city. So yeah, uh, yeah. You are giving me a, a, a small passerelle to also comment on on what you said. Maybe I miss uh, explain. I was not talking about history. I said Beirut history, but not the history. But Beirut history is using archaeology and telling. That means the museum role is to tell is is to tell the history of Beirut through archaeology. Now, uh, yes, the museum, to tell Beirut's story today, everything on field is not telling the whole story of Beirut. You have many other period does not exist, will be reflected through artifact inside the museum, but also through film, uh, through a three-dimension projection on, on the wall. Uh, I mean, I, we don't have, if we, I don't for any reason, we have, would like to show a a Phoenician uh, uh, shape, so no way to show it because we don't have. So, uh, so we will we will we will ask technology to help us in order to to explain all this period uh, representing the history of Beirut using archaeology because the archaeology is. Uh, I mean, we are lucky because the oldest part is really what we have in the tell. Correct? I'm saying no, not completely. We have also more recent. Uh, uh, period. We have the Ottoman period and the Tal also, not only... Yeah, little. Little, okay. Uh, the, we, start, uh, we start with the... Well, we don't have it stratified that well, but we have Bronze Age before the yeah. period. Yeah, we have Bronze Age. And we have glasses of this. And I remember uh, Dr. Khouri, he said when the one day we sat and I promised him that the, 
the eastern side will be treated from landscape and from lighting standpoint because here we have the Hellenistic Tower and the uh, the Bronze Age uh, glasses and that and this. Yeah. I had a Robert, just a quick last one. I had a question about security, but I think we covered that quite well. My final question is, what happened to the red box in the museum? Why did it go? Yeah, oh, red box. You know, the, the architects are uh, strange animals. So um, this, is, well, this is part of the program. The program is still evolving. It's, it's not, I mean, and, and then uh, we had a piece of the program. The Chrono Lounge was up. Uh, we, this is opaque space that open and, and close and then today we are saying, Lorenzo is saying, we have so many opaque space below grade, this space is offering um, a viewing platform to decide why to put the glass, why to put this uh, box here, then this box could be red or other color, so it's not a substantial element of the design. Okay. <laughs>